I think maybe the over-the-top dislike some fans exhibited towards Dark Souls 2 caused the developers to walk back on ideas that were genuinely better. Okay, I, 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 I could spend a good deal of this video defending Dark Souls 2. In fact, I'm going to compile a video looking at the central complaints about it. Um, and why all of them are wrong and lies from criminals, and I'm gonna put that up in a separate video a bit later on. Uh, when that comes up, I'll put the link here. So, okay, cool. Uh, back to Bloodborne. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to my ridiculously long video series all about H. Bomberguy's video in defense of Dark Souls 2. We've covered so much, but there's so much more. This section is about the concept of a game telling the player how to play, a concept that Harris has invented a name for. So let's get a little context, and then I can respond. Some of you might be familiar with my video about Bloodborne. It kinda revolutionized the face of game design for all time. Just kidding. But it did kind of invent a newish concept, at least I think it does, I haven't heard anyone else using it before, called play conditioning, which refers to the way a game leads you to play it with the execution of its mechanics. So first of all, his Bloodborne video is pretty much nonsense and acts as a blight on information regarding the Souls series. I would make a response to that video about how inaccurate it is, but I'm currently frying a bigger fish. New players for the Souls series might actually listen to his video and play the game as he recommends. This would be a sorry state of affairs in terms of player choice and freedom. Demon Souls, Dark Souls 1, 2, and 3 are all games in which you are tested with a brand new set of limits compared to your average third-person action fighter. The game is going to make you responsible for each of your decisions. It's going to punish the ever-loving hell out of you if you don't pay attention to the rules and recognize the environment for what it is. A hazard. Almost everything is a hazard of some sort. The game has plenty of pieces of information that get you closer and closer to understanding it and ultimately mastering it, but it takes a hell of a long time for a new player to get there. The first thing someone needs to know is how to not die, since that is one of the first memorable things that's going to happen when you play. Dark Souls gives you a damage blocker and a damage dealer in one corridor and provides an enemy to practice on. Surrounding you are several tips on how to operate the controller you're holding. Past that, it's up to you to react to this harsh world. Since you would feel very much victimized and fragile, you can pick strong armor. You can hold up your shield, you can wait for the enemy to be exhausted and go for an opportunity to strike, and if you take a hit, you may worry frantically about how this could be the end. This is an experience to revere, the time you spent being afraid and cautious when everything was new. Ask veterans if they would like to be able to experience that all over again. Many would. The longer you spent with the game, the less you needed to hold the shield up because you knew when to use it. If you beat the game, you can try out other builds and pathways. People who master the game, similarly to many games, will then know how to avoid all incoming damage and threats, thus choosing to play as a glass cannon resulting in quick boss fights and domination of the game itself. But still, that trade-off means that if you're caught out, you die. There is a cycle to Dark Souls that is parallel to confidence and knowledge, and this is probably why Dark Souls is so often referenced as a thing representing life in many ways. Seeing a player struggle in the beginning and master their own style in the end is wonderful to see. Their progress in domination is the culmination of time spent and appreciated. The glass cannon builds in Dark Souls usually amount to no armor or little armor, high endurance and damage, and a heavy weapon. This is almost the complete opposite to an opening build, which will likely focus health and split the levels across the board. In conjunction with a strong shield and armor set, allowing the player to absorb the games in their own way. Learning how best to manage your resources is the experience. There are, of course, variations and exceptions, but the point is the Soulsborne series excels at allowing the player freedom to choose, the freedom to experiment, and the freedom to grow. Harris's Bloodborne video is filled with a myriad of issues, but the culmination of the video is him telling the audience that playing with a shield is less fun. This clunky perspective is brought on by him saying that he enjoys playing with more movement, and how Dark Souls 1 taught players to knuckle up with a shield, and people had to figure out that there are better ways to play. I'm not responding to that video here because the conclusion has been ripped into by random internet goers and his own audience. He has immense trouble dealing with the idea that people can play a game like Dark Souls however they want and be considered right in their path, whatever offenses or defenses they choose. It's simply a matter of semantics. All he needs to say is that they are playing the game inefficiently, or they're playing the game too defensively. 
for his taste. It is a real shame that he could be ruining that opening experience for so many people by telling them to play in ways that they may not be comfortable in or prepared for, which is very interesting to me. And you should fact check this yourself, don't just take my word for it. Harris's video on Fallout 3 is pretty well written and has a deep understanding of RPGs and what they should stand for. He meticulously points out many flaws with Fallout 3 that the mainstream avoids and shows the game to be hollow but he made one mistake. He called his video, Fallout 3 is garbage and here's why. I know he likes his clickbait, but this means people would be hitting dislike before even listening to his argument as opposed to calling the video a Fallout 3 critique. Alas, he got a myriad of downvotes and that happens all the time. Half the conversations I have defending my own videos on Reddit end with a person ignoring me and hitting the downvote. Humans suck at nuance. If you peer down the comments, however, the top voted comments are all in thunderous agreement with Harris and his video. This is because when the dust settles, the people who watched the video have control over the comment section. Scoot on over to Bloodborne is genius and here's why, which is heavily in favor with likes because people love Bloodborne and that title is very agreeable. But but skip on down to the comments and it almost has every top comment being about how he's wrong on the crux of the argument. That fun is not objective. And they're right. But they go further, some people are talking about how playing defensively can't be considered a lesser way to play. That playing with a shield is an option people take and honestly this is why the Bloodborne video is just terrible. It's the narrative structure poisoning the analysis like with Noah's Outlast video. He makes everything about how Dark Souls essentially forced you to use a shield while Bloodborne teaches you that shields were a mistake that From Software want to retroactively fix. He says that he isn't sure about this, so I'm not going to go into him too hard, but I despise it when people invent new design labels when there are either ones in existence or that can describe it in simpler terms. Play conditioning, or the act of a video game directing the player with set pieces and mechanical instructions, is what happens when the player simply plays the game. It means players are responding to the way the world talks to them and how it reacts based on their actions, how it implies what they're supposed to do with a particular thing. For fans of my channel, I I call it the tutorial when it's signposts and instructional stuff, like objective lessons. And if we involve stuff that's a little bit more like the developers are trying to guide you, then I call it guidance. Though I'd say tutorials come under guidance as well, it's like an umbrella term. Mark Brown called it the invisible tutorial. And many other critics call it as it is, a set piece or set pieces in a game telling you how to do something without telling you directly. The thing is, it's been around since before Half-Life, and Harris for some reason thinks this is a new classification. I mean, the poor bastard has some guy copy his video beat for beat and make hundreds of thousands of views out of it. Which I genuinely feel for Harris on, since if you're gonna copy work, copy the good stuff at least. The problem with guidance in video games is that it's just that. It doesn't dictate a player's route or path. This is one of the reasons Harris's argument will fall apart and he'll be using extremely slippery language throughout, but let's explore it. When a game kills you very easily, tells you to prepare to die and hands you a shield and teaches you how to use it, you're taught specific rules about that game's world and it sticks with you. The rest of the game experience could have been better served by a different early approach, but you've been quite definitively taught a specific one and it'll probably be a struggle to unlearn it. So this is where we begin. Harris is saying the Dark Souls 1 is essentially making you use a shield, that you will be killed quickly, the game is subtitled Prepare to Die, and you are handed a shield while being taught how to use it. Let's approach these one by one. Prepare to Die was simply the subtitle for the PC release. The player base is spread very hugely over console players who aren't even aware of that moniker. And Dark Souls 2 is far less subtle about the memes of death that follow the series than Dark Souls 1 was. So as long as you're willing to admit that Dark Souls 2 encouraged shield use more in relation to this aspect, then the point stands. He then says the game kills you very easily. However, if you choose the armored classes to start, even the Asylum Demon has a rough time killing you. Knuckling up saves you and gives you more time to explore the land or enemies, which is invaluable to a new player. If you're naked and jumping around, you will die fast, sure, but this applies to all Souls games, glass cannon builds versus tank builds. What I'm saying here is that shields will give the player a stronger chance to live and learn, while not using the shield often results in death because learning to dodge at the right time is grueling when you first play the game. You can do it, but if you're new, it's gonna be tough and the shield offers a reprieve for those newcomers. For veterans, however, there are several scenarios in which the shield is useful. Blocking basic mobs and bosses to open up attacks is always going to be safer and useful. Blocking magical attacks as opposed to dodging them can be far more reliable. And then there's the parry riposte, which is very formidable with a shield and simultaneously very powerful. I doubt many would consider a parry riposte to be a defensive move. So, prepare to die and the game killing you easily are not strict moments of guidance towards using the shield. 
It is more about the player recognizing what tools do what and how they are balanced. For example, are you good at finding your target and nailing a shot between the eyes? Then take the sharpshooter, but watch out, you have low defenses. Are you good at crowd controlling hordes and positioning? Take the pyro, but watch out, your damage output is not as high and it's spread out. You want to tear shit up and tank? Take the Berserker, but watch out, you can easily be swarmed. If you know when to block and subsequently attack, and are far more comfortable with it, then utilize those mechanics. The game is not guiding you towards you having to definitively use anything. This is the fundamental that is insulted when Harris makes this assessment. I know many people who wanted to play as Gandalf when they were going in for the first time, and so the game does not strictly direct you to use a shield and staff. It is far more profitable in terms of mechanics to utilize the staff and a secondary weapon. Just like Gandalf, in fact. The game will limit your ability to dole out damage if you strictly have the staff early game, so what does that tell you? Pick up another weapon and scale it with intelligence, then hold each part in each hand. This goes the same for the Pyromancer, but providing the items at the base gives the player the option. These statistics are presented to the player, there are no lies or directions to choose the shield. This is a natural progression resulting from the rules in the world, but I would still say that anything can happen and that the game allows for a whole multitude of options since the downside is that sorcerers are typically weaker and health and resistances yet ranged. This is balance. I always attributed the loadout of a shield for each class as an excuse for the tutorial to always have something to spawn when teaching players how to block attacks. It is a basic mechanic to teach. That simple. Since by your own logic they teach you about and how to use a few things in the beginning, they do that for your offensive option as well as your defensive option. Who's to say they aren't telling players to focus the sword and drop the shield since the sword comes after? Like it's better than the shield. God, could you, could you imagine if I actually made arguments like that? Well, uh, check out this one. Dark Souls 3 actually spawns you with a shield with many of the classes. You see, this is because they didn't actually give you one in Dark Souls 2, and therefore, players didn't realize that they were even a thing. Like, ugh, just, I'm sorry, just, it's been fucking 40 plus minutes of listening to stuff like that. These kinds of arguments have no place in objectivity, describing developer intentions for the player, nor is it evidence of restrictive guidance. The funny thing is, even if the fucking developers said, yes, this is exactly what the message was supposed to be, it doesn't matter because players can hear it in many different ways. We can say that they show you how to swing weapons and then provide an actual weapon than an actual enemy, so therefore they want you to kill the enemy with the weapon they provided by pressing the buttons that swings the weapon. This is undeniable. But the idea that players are being told that they should be using the shield in this game and they are playing defensively because Dark Souls encourages that is something you can only guess at. You cannot know this unless you have direct quotes and the plank shield from Bloodborne does not count. We'll get to that though. The game serves to tell players to use their basic moves and then provides some gear for free that can be accessed by any other class equally as you move on. You learn by playing. You learn about the advanced and expert ways of approaching the world from understanding each of the items and NPCs see interactions while learning the similarities of boss weaknesses and how the world reacts to you. This applies to all of the Soulsborne games. Yet Harris believes you are taught one specific thing and the game would have been better if it had perhaps taught something else. So let's see. I brought this up in the video to make the point that Bloodborne quite deftly pushes the player into a more frenetic direction with a few subtle changes to its base mechanics and much wider reaching executions of those mechanics. There is still one, or maybe two, shields in the game, but you don't find them for so long that you learned not to use them. They exist almost to show you that you never really needed them. He says that Bloodborne quite deftly pushes the player into a more frenetic direction. Now, frenetic means fast and energetic in a rather wild, uncontrolled way. So he's saying that Bloodborne pushes you to be fast, uncontrolled, and wild. The problem with this for me is that it's like saying a racing game is pushing you to be driving a car. You are fast in Bloodborne. You have loads of stamina to use. You get loads of heals to spam. None of this pushes anything. These are facts. You are not slow in Bloodborne like you are slow in Dark Souls. Your character is rushing no matter what. You don't have equipped load. Only a minor tweak to your stamina regeneration based on your gear. You can't be punished for slow attacks as you are in Dark Souls because they are all fast outside of a few massively profitable charge moves. The game itself is built on completely different rules and mechanics to Dark Souls. You actually give yourself less opportunity to survive in Bloodborne if you knuckle up since you need to take advantage of the rally system. A system that heals you if you attack after being hit. This means that being wild or fast or 
frenetic, is rewarded where it is often punished in Dark Souls. This is something that changes a huge amount of your attitude towards the game that is not done in Dark Souls as a series. After all, why be defensive when that makes you more vulnerable? These games are not the same with different guidance, they are completely different games with a whole slew of different rules. Of course, if we're talking very broadly, then these two games can be put into a similar genre, but when we're talking very specifically, they are completely bloody different. The shield engendered passivity. That wording's actually kind of genius. The game's own item description directly blames shields themselves, not players for not realising how they're supposed to use them. I think that's really clever, and also an honest admission that they kind of messed up in Dark Souls 1. So here we are, the discussion on the item description that changed everything. If we run with all of the systematic changes I have previously mentioned that Bloodborne has, then it should be clear that a shield is a terrible idea in that game. You don't even have a meaningful choice of shields from the get-go, no balanced or nuanced set of options, all the way to the end. They haven't designed the game with shields being something they expect people to use. You're going to miss out on healing yourself by attacking back if you choose to simply put the shield up. Playing aggressively in Bloodborne is both the offensive and defensive choice in many cases. So, having the item description essentially confirming that the only shield you have access to until the DLC is going to put you at a disadvantage makes sense, but this doesn't apply to any other game. If we were to remove shields from Dark Souls, it would have been a way more difficult experience for new players, and veterans would get frustrated since they still represent a source of variety. Bloodborne, on the other hand, wasn't built with the idea of nuance in shields. It wasn't built with shields being a significant part of the game at all. Not to mention that if we're taking the description so seriously all of a sudden, then look at the Lock Shields one. An artisanal shield crafted with blue glass, originally used to safeguard the leader presiding over a sacred healing church ceremony, and later supplied to tomb prospectors, in particular those exploring the Labyrinth of Ease. The blue is fashioned after a lake, and the shield greatly reduces all forms of non-physical damage. Again, taking this very seriously, this shield is used to protect the leader of the Sacred Healing Church and that it greatly reduces all forms of non-physical damage. So I guess shields are great for protection of important people, and I mean, who's more important to you than you, and greatly reduce incoming damage. There is nothing passive about that, blocking an attack is inherently active as a position. Look again at the description of the wooden shield. A crude wooden shield used by the masses who have arisen to join the hunt. Hunters do not normally employ shields, ineffectual against the strength of the beasts as they tend to be. Shields are nice, but not if they engender passivity. Hunters do not tend to use them. You aren't strictly a hunter in Dark Souls as you are in Bloodborne. This is specific to Bloodborne, and as the description says, if they engender passivity, not that they definitively cause it. On top of this, look at the description of the wooden shield in Dark Souls 1. Makeshift shield built from wooden planks provides minimal protection, but at the cost of moderate humiliation. This is even more off-putting than the description in Bloodborne. It uses the term humiliation. You may accuse many creators and critics of omitting information to your analysis, but you are clearly omitting things here yourself, and you have been throughout the entire video. Besides, why is it that you spend so many points of your video talking about player freedom being the best in Dark Souls 2, but in the same video talk about the correct way to play Dark Souls games in general? Bloodborne pushes you not to use a shield because there isn't a system supporting them in place, just like how you can't use life gems or blood vials in Dark Souls 1. Bloodborne uses 50% of its shields to tell you they won't be used in the game, because there are just two, and you've already been pushed to use a gun instead. Which, among everything else, is precisely why you shouldn't be using shields in Bloodborne. They don't allow you to parry like guns do. Which is inherently important and another huge benefit to many battles in the game, not to mention it's incredibly important to defeating many bosses. Shields do not offer enough of a benefit in Bloodborne, but it is often paramount to a new player in Dark Souls 1. He says that he sees this as an honest admission that they kind of messed up in Dark Souls 1. I can't even begin to understand that sentence whatsoever, since Bloodborne and Dark Souls are not the same game, which should be clear to everyone by now. Some folks disagreed with my comments that playing with a shield was an inherently wrong, slow, overly defensive or boring way to play, and I do have to stress that's just my opinion. You can play the games however you want, I'm just describing how the game is most fun in my opinion, and the ways I think the game leads people to play it in those more fun ways than the previous ones. Harris is making sure to cover himself now because of the backlash he got previously for telling people they weren't having the feelings they experienced, and rightly so. Using a shield, as I have previously pointed out, gives you different options. To say that it is inherently wrong, slow, or overly defensive or boring is highly inaccurate of the reality of these mechanics, but if it is his opinion, 
opinion, to which he is now changing, then I suppose he can have that opinion, but I do not understand how he could possibly come to this conclusion when being so in favour of player freedom and choice. Not to mention the sheer lack of logistics to that statement. It's like saying Gears of War 3 taught players to run and gun properly with the sawn-off shotgun, and then they go back to Gears of War 1 and 2 to do the same, only the sawn-off wasn't in the previous games. In this case, the shield system of risk slash reward and nuance isn't in Bloodborne, and they clearly didn't want it to be. Thankfully, he has now said, you can play the game however you want. I think that's really much more nuanced and also an honest admission that Harris really did kind of mess up in his Bloodborne video. While Bloodborne is undisputedly the master at this, Dark Souls 2 does a lot of really great things with play conditioning also, things that other critics dismiss as minor tweaks or just don't talk about at all. In the Bloodborne video, my central example was the shield, and we might as well start there too because people don't fucking mention this. Dark Souls 2 has shields, it has plenty of them, and they're fine, they work well and you can get some very defendy ones that do all the stuff you need and you can buff them lots of different ways too. Apparently Bloodborne is the master of guidance in that it told you you shouldn't use a shield, which is incredibly weak as an assessment and I have no idea what proof he's been provided for it. All of the games guide you naturally by reactions from the world and tooltips. There really isn't one that did it the best, but if I had to pick, Dark Souls 1 has the greatest opening to take you into its game piece by piece, culminating in a grand test for the mechanics by far, and I suppose that correlates strongly with guidance. Though all of that is really just my opinion. The thing is, we haven't discussed this, he has simply said that Bloodborne is undisputably the master of it, so never mind, I suppose. Next, he begins to ramp up the thing people haven't noticed in Dark Souls 2 that doesn't get mentioned by critics, and if they are, they are shrugged off as minor tweaks. So I'm excited to see what he's referring to. Aside from that, he has given a very telling description of shields in Dark Souls as a resource. Defendi and you can buff them. The shield as a resource has already been talked to death by me, so I'll just say that this is clearly a lack of experience with the shield. And how it's used. Harris doesn't like them and doesn't use them, so please follow suit. This is very much the same sort of attitude he has with healing, with focus. It's throughout the video, and honestly, it, the pattern is, if he isn't aware of it, or if he doesn't like it, then it's not right. But here's the thing, only one class starts with a shield at all in Dark Souls 2. In fact, that class, the warrior, begins life with a broken sword. Every other character starts with some semblance of a fighting setup. The knight has a broadsword, the swordsman has two plus one swords, the bandit has an axe and a bow, and so on. Starting with a shield handicaps you in many ways at the start of this game. It forces you to use ingenuity to get access to a weapon that's more viable. It's not even that great a shield. So, according to Harris, the mere fact that a class doesn't start with an item means that you aren't encouraged to use said item, despite the fact that he says a little later that you will search for a weapon because what you are provided with isn't sufficient. He is happy to talk about player choice when it comes to anything but shields, but when it comes to shields? Well, that would fight the narrative, so no shields. He says that the warrior class is the only class that doesn't start with some semblance of a fighting setup, despite his weapon dealing 80 damage for every 100 damage the short sword wielding swordsman does in the opening. Since the enemies have around 150 health in things betwixt, it takes two or three swings all the same. It does not represent a detrimental change. You are actually very able to kill most enemies with a broken straight sword easily in the game, despite its name, because Dark Souls 2 buffed it since the previous incarnation. The idea that you have to get access to another weapon that is more viable is something that you will do no matter what your loadout is, depending on finding something else or finding materials to buff your own. You have to find materials that make your build more viable, and that is inherently within all the games, otherwise you will be punished. Though the act of picking up and equipping a new weapon is referred to as ingenuity by Harris, and that is something that I I need an explanation of that because holy fuck. Harris also says the shield isn't that great, which doesn't tell me what he thinks that supports. Let's say he thinks the shield being weak tells the player not to use shields, then why have 70 different shields throughout the game? That's close to double the shields of Dark Souls 1. Why have a set of shield mechanics and other items that support shields with more pros and cons and chances for crazy builds if they didn't want you to use them? Why have a shield merchant immediately after the tutorial that sells a shield that blocks 95% of incoming physical damage, which let's not forget is available before you even enter the main part of the game, before you even have a chance to buy weapons. Why have a shield that you can find in the opening area that has 90% physical block? You can get this for free. Why does the item description for the first shield, of which we are all paying so much attention to now, say this? A small shield made of iron. The unusual design suggests a foreign origin. Lightweight despite its iron construction and sturdy despite its small size, but not sufficient to protect one from real danger. 
not sufficient to protect one from real danger. This is directly implying that in order to protect yourself from real danger sufficiently, you should get a better shield. Dark Souls 2 encourages you to go and find a good shield to use if you want to, and provides ample opportunity before the game even starts to do so. Hell, the basic mobs drop shields, for Christ's sake. Dark Souls 1 teaches you, through the shield descriptions, that some are small and less defensive, but lighter. Some offer poison resistance, and some are far better for parry riposte. This is what I'm referring to that is missing in Bloodborne, and what you have failed to experience yourself. For all your complaints about the more unfair or poorly made parts of Dark Souls 1, it is very telling that you also refuse to play the game while capitalizing on the use of a shield. It's almost like you probably don't have much experience with a large portion of the game, that you're completely unaware of many systems that actually exist. Other classes having no shield are forced to use dodging or parrying or make good use of what they're given. This is a tiny, tiny simple change to just starting loadouts, but it's fantastic design. It alters the shape of the entire game experience. You're expected, told even, to make use of the engine in a vastly different way from how you're led to think you're supposed to play the first game. Forced to use dodging or parrying? Something that is designed to be easier with certain daggers or shields? Also, you still have to dodge while using shields. This is a nuance that is once again omitted. You can't block all attacks from all bosses and enemies. And you can't block basic attacks if you run low on stamina. There is a full resource management angle to all of this that is not appreciated or even recognized by Harris. He says that you have to make good use of what you're given, which again is precisely what comes with the shields. He calls this fantastic design, which I'm sorry, but you've been calling loads of small differences within the games that. It is colored exceptionally by your personal experience as opposed to being something truly innovative. Your definition of genius and fantastic and ingenuity and innovative are bloody weak if they're used to describe Dark Souls 2 in every facet. He says you have to make use of the engine in a vastly different way, while previously mentioning parrying and dodging. Both of those are very prominent in Dark Souls 1 as strategies, but he talks about this as if Dark Souls 1 doesn't have it. This is such a weird salad of petty criticism without any semblance of evidence that I can't take it seriously. Dark Souls as a series is about freedom of choice. I'm sorry that you love the black sheep of the series and that your friend was playing it in a way you deemed wrong and only Bloodborne taught him how to play Dark Souls correctly, but that's not evidence of anything. Shields you acquire early on don't even block 100% of damage, and you don't have much life, so blocking is treated as a last resort for if you really don't know what else to do about an attack or haven't learned its timing yet. Dark Souls 2 is the first game in the series where you started getting players who were more casually walking around without a shield at all, preferring two-handing or the new power stance added for dual-wielding characters. Okay, so you say that the early game shields don't block 100% of damage, but you fail to mention how much they do block. For those who don't know, the shield you spawn with blocks 85% of damage. That's 15% from maximum. The shield with the highest damage block before you even start the main game is 95%. 5% away from maximum. Not to mention that Macduff literally sells a 100% damage block shield, meaning that players will have access to one very early on in the game. So to say they don't even block 100% seems a little disingenuous since you also say that you don't have much life, implying that any life lost is bad for the player. Do you want to see how much damage the opening enemies do to you when you have the spawn shield up in this game? These things aren't going to kill you if you have the shield up from the beginning. The shield, by the way, makes parrying extremely easy and can be supplemented by rolling if the attacks are far too powerful. This is a neat little system that is running as intended, and is running just like it did in Dark Souls 1. You are really reading into a landscape that simply isn't there, since you can, as I said, grab a 95% block shield before getting here as well. And for clarity, players were deciding to opt out of shield gameplay long before Dark Souls 2, but the same experiences were prevalent throughout both games. Games, I would imagine, since you would need to speak to all the people who played the game first, because that's the only way you can really find this out for sure. And who's done that? Certainly not me, or Harris. By the time you reach shields that actually block lots of damage the way early shields did in the first game, you've employed a level of skill getting to them that means using them would be a waste of a good hand you could be keeping another weapon in, or some magic. Dodging like this would have seemed like a needless, risky waste of time to the old me if I had a shield and could block the damage perfectly well. 
but it would have been so slow. You don't need Dark Souls 2 to teach you to play this way, obviously. You can figure it out if you do a lot of practicing or look up a lot of YouTube videos or do PvP or whatever, but being forced to play that way by the game makes you learn it so much faster. He makes a point here that you'll have to spend so much time without a shield that blocks a significant amount of damage like in Dark Souls 1 that you will have learned not to use it, once again ignoring that you start with one that stops 85% of damage, and every character can get one that stops 95% before starting the main game. That's a lot of block damage, not to mention that you could simply not use it in Dark Souls 1 as well. The problem here isn't the omission of facts though, it's the idea that the game doesn't want you to use shields but still offers 70 to you. Harris will refuse to accept that Dark Souls 1 and 2 and 3 are are all in tandem with shields being an important option to players that want what they offer, with Bloodborne being something that sits adjacent with its own rules and values. Tell me how effective the guns are in Dark Souls. He then says you could have been using the other hand for something else, like magic, which, like I said, is something I know people went into Dark Souls 1 wanting to do regardless of the fact that the game provides it to you. Since ultimately you have to put these items into your gear slots, that is already giving you the freedom to choose, it isn't automatic. He then uses another anecdote about himself that is completely irrelevant and you could easily create the opposite story and present it the same way he does. But he moves on to finally admit that you do not need Dark Souls 2 to know that a shield is optional, though he mistakenly thinks that looking into YouTube or PvP is the only thing that will get you that information, which is a real burn towards what he considers the average person's intelligence or creativity and towards managing their own gear. Again, he assumes that there is something that forces you to play one way in Dark Souls 1, which is blatantly untrue to anyone who's played the game. But fundamentally, it's not true for anybody who pays attention to the systems. All you need to do is explore, try out miracles, pyromancy, sorcery, heavy weapons, dual wielding. Try it all. Hell, you could even try shields. Other touches can be seen here too, like parrying. In Dark Souls 1, parrying offered a brief, clumsy moment to get in a riposte. Oh, and you can't even do a riposte if you're two-handing in Dark Souls 1. Thanks, fuckers. The sound effect was satisfying, but hard to make out if anything else was happening. The window to respond was short, and the animations that played where enemies were parried were often really short and vague. I didn't parry a lot in Dark Souls 1 because, frankly, I didn't trust the game enough to let me capitalise on it. So this part really annoyed many people. Harris can be seen here to really show his bias towards Dark Souls 2 and his blatant lack of knowledge on both games in question. First of all, I don't know what he thinks is clumsy about the parry animation in Dark Souls 1. He doesn't develop that, but he says it's brief and he is right. More on that in a second. He says you can't parry if you're two-handing in Dark Souls 1. This was a very strange statement because many do this regularly when they play. It is indeed possible and he is literally just wrong on this, while also behaving as smugly as usual. Which once again made it hard for people to take him seriously in terms of his ideas when he misses basic facts. Do the parry, then attack. Or if you want to do it while you're two-handing, simply swap and hit R1. Simple. He says that it was hard to make out if anything else was happening. Now, not only is this bit really poorly written, but what was he expecting from a parry, other than the chance to riposte? What else would be happening? He said the window to respond was short, and the animations that played when enemies were parried were often really short. Which is true, and shows a very important balancing aspect to prevent the riposte from being incredibly easy to commit to. But he also calls it vague. Is there anything vague about this? He then shares another anecdote about his experience with the parry riposte system that is irrelevant since anyone could again make the same argument in reverse about several systems in Dark Souls 2. In Dark Souls 2, parrying triggers a loud, ultra-cool sound. The enemies fall down in a protracted, dear god my entire world is ending animation and stay there for ages while they wait for you to capitalise. This is, in a word, encouraging. You feel like you've made a decisive move, and might even have already won. You feel rewarded for learning how an enemy attacks. It's obvious you've pulled it off, and you have plenty of time to react to knowing you've done it. I felt, like I said, encouraged to keep parrying. Instead of abandoning it after the early levels, or only really using it on heavily choreographed enemies like I did in 1. So he then says that parrying makes an ultra cool sound. This is very similar to the sound in the first game, so I don't really quite understand that. Then he describes the experience as encouraging because of the amount of time and space you are given to receive the advantage. The problem here is that it is encouraging because it has a far lower skill wall to capitalize on. This change makes parry repost the staple of PvP because as long as you land part 1, you win, while it was built around timing in Dark Dark Souls 1. This may very well be why they reversed this decision among many things in Dark Souls 3. Not to mention that parry repost system in Dark Souls 2 can be clumsy as well. 
Oh, great. No, no, no physical attack. Okay, cool. Fuck you. Then again, I guess it's about how you define clumsy. From that, he then talks about how it feels, and once again, you can easily make an argument in reverse for that. As this video progresses, you can see far more arguments from anecdotes and feelings than evidence, and it is a real shame. Parrying really only came into its own in Bloodborne, which handed you a weapon specifically for doing it, and made even monstrous enemies parryable, but this represents a step in the right direction. I realised, playing Dark Souls 2, that the reason it seemed too hard to get to the level of skill other people were displaying was because getting there required lots of time investment and practice to get around the fact the game itself did a pretty bad job of getting you there by itself. The phrase get good has been around for ages, but was massively popularised in the Souls community, and this is because the gulf of skill is so wide between new and experienced players that it's almost impossible to help someone get on their level, the only advice being, basically, to keep playing until they become good at the game. Okay, we are spiralling into more and more writing issues here as things are changing and popping out of nowhere as non sequiturs, and I mean, what's this? The game itself did a pretty bad job of getting you there itself. Okay, nice and slowly, let's look at what he said. Parrying only really came into its own in Bloodborne. This is true in that you were given a gun and its only purpose was to parry and potentially finish off an enemy if you're lucky. That is strictly a downgrade from an item that has an effect on blocking incoming damage, changing your resistances, dealing limited damage as a resort, and enabling easier parries with a nuance of beneficial effects on your character. Not to mention that there would be a resource management aspect with the equipped load. If anything, Blood Bloodborne has simplified the system for parrying compared to the Souls series. This wouldn't be a step in the right direction, it's a step in a different direction. Besides, this wouldn't be good for the Souls games, but it's fine for a new IP, I suppose. He then has a complete change in topic with a bizarre anecdote about how the games themselves don't teach you how to play them well, and the evidence for this is the get good meme. The problem here is that many games are something you have to get good at, and this would include the more complicated games I mentioned way back, including Civilization, Dwarf Fortress, Starcraft, Oxygen Not Included, Factorio, The Binding of Isaac, and Crusader Kings, not to mention Guitar Hero, Audio Surf, CSGO, PUBG, and rhythm games in general. The games stay the same for the most part. It's the player who learns about the rules, mechanics, and sometimes the meta to gain advantages, and how fast you learn is down to you, but they provide all of the tools you're going to need in the Souls games very efficiently. So I'll have to say this part is absolutely nonsense, and you are wrong. Not only about Dark Souls 1, but about Dark Souls 2 as well. The game provides ample opportunity for people to find out about the basic mechanics as well as learning from the environmental reactions to their choices. No matter how you look at it, the fact the community has trouble introducing the game it's built around to new players constitutes something of a problem. And this is a problem I feel Dark Souls 2 solves with some very careful changes in its design. I said before that I thought Dark Souls was incredible, but I owe that to DS2 showing me the way to appreciate it properly, and the way to approach it in a way that was actually really fun. He says that the community surrounding the games has trouble introducing people to the series beyond saying get good. But what do you think all of the wiki information is for? You know, all of the guides on how to blitz the game? You can go through Dark Souls 1 handheld by the community behind the wikis and you will beat the game with relative ease, but that isn't what the community tends to want. They want everyone to learn it for themselves because it acts as a fantastic experience, and then refer back to the wiki when they want to know things they didn't find or see themselves. Dark Souls is one of the best examples in gaming on how to direct a player with hidden guidance to a position where they felt their perseverance and understanding gave them their win, and that's special. Telling people, for example, that they need to go to Andre with the large and very large embers located in these specific positions to get a weapon that'll slice through most challenges throughout the game takes away from what the player could have achieved by themselves. But then again, you've already shared that that's how you've been directing your friends when they play the game. When a friend was playing through Dark Souls 1 and asking for help, I would just tell them literally the thing they were meant to do to get past that area. I don't know where you got the idea that Dark Souls as a series doesn't teach its players how to progress from a beginner to an expert. It is a gold standard for that very aspect, and saying that Dark Souls 2 solved it also doesn't make any sense since you've only talked about parrying and shield usage, both of which have been fully explored and shown to be inaccurate as changes for the better in the future title. In fact, you could argue that they are far worse considering the amount of changes back in Dark Souls 3. Regardless, these things do not prevent a player from learning how to become a master of the world at hand. You began this section with a grounded aspect of evidence and then you ended it with yet another anecdote and how you didn't know why Dark Souls 1 was good until you played Dark Souls 2. Which, by the way, is the case for many people since Dark Souls 2 changed so many fundamentally important pieces of design from Dark Souls 1 that it allowed players to pinpoint the strengths of the series being lost in its sequel. He also made another argument about fun again, but that's a rabbit hole I'm not jumping into. 
The blueprint for Bloodborne, the bloodprint, if you will, of a lot of creative decisions, lies in Dark Souls 2. I'm unsure if it directly inspired the attitudes to shields and healing and level design and so on in Bloodborne, but even if it didn't, the way Bloodborne seemingly builds on these ideas for me shows that 2 was a step in the right direction, even if it didn't get everything right. The predecessors from Bloodborne were the Souls series, not Dark Souls 2 before Demon Souls and Dark Souls 1, and not in some other order. This is the kind of thing you would have to ask the developers to confirm the parts that were taken or developed. You can't know. Dark Souls and Bloodborne are as different as Dark Souls 2 and Bloodborne, so this would be inaccurate regardless, especially since Dark Souls 2 is stuffed more with shields than Dark Souls 1 was, and the healing is far from similar, being percentage-based, and something you eventually had to farm while in Dark Souls 2 it was spammed with ease. Bloodborne is still difficult with blood vials, the same cannot be said for the vast majority of Dark Souls 2's gameplay. Ultimately, the main design decisions were stepped back out of the series for Dark Souls 2 by From Software when creating Dark Souls 3, and it caused a sigh of relief from the the community surrounding it. This isn't evidence of anything really other than the attitudes of the developers and the attitudes of the audience, but Harris has shared several times already that whatever decisions were made as a piece of design in a sequel compared to the previous is, is like evidence that it was the right decision or what the developers wanted, so what can we draw from Dark Souls 3 about Dark Souls 2 in that case? Dark Souls 2 has a bunch of interesting and radical ideas that were scrapped for returning to a grounded and more systemically balanced ARPG. Nothing of significance was reused from Dark Souls 2, aside from the corpse of the latter dude, but Dark Souls 1 is present throughout Dark Souls 3, perhaps at moments to its detriment. What you could take from that is that From Software considered a myriad of choices in Dark Souls 2 as a mistake. Perhaps you will be saying that the developers didn't understand their own game, and they failed to realize what was good about Dark Souls 2 as you've already said in my intro to this series every single time. But then you'd be right back in Hypocrite Town, wouldn't you? What, did the developers not realize how their game worked? Well, apparently they did, and thank God for that. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for watching. Next time we're diving headlong into the story aspect of his video. You can appreciate now that there should only be around about three parts left by my judgment, and um, I'm sure they're going to be spicy. Thanks for keeping up with my work, and I will see you next time. To say that it is inherently wrong, slow, or overly defensive or boring is highly inaccurate of the reality of these mechanics, but if it is his but if it but if it but if it is his opinion, but if it but if but if it Oh Chlorinth Ring What What Okay, we need to exchange one of these. Ash Knuckle Ring, go to hell. Fuck yes. Oh my god, that's so fucking Craigasm. Okay. Oh my fuck, I looked away because I saw birds outside my window. <laughs> fuck! <laughs> oh shit. <laughs> fuck you.